I was pointing out that that 30-year gain in life expectancy is an extraordinary human achievement. In fact, it had never been attained ever before in human history. And in Roman times, the average life expectancy, surprisingly, was only 20. Because of the death of children and women giving birth to kids, that was the truth of it. So it's an extraordinary event that happened in the 20th century. And it's likely to become more remarkable than this one. Now, is everybody hearing me okay? Yes. But there are genuine concerns and understandable concerns by some economists, policymakers, politicians, and pundits. Can we afford this growing number of older people? Will the fact of a population growing older lead to stagnation of the economy? Will there be intergenerational conflicts? Will chronic illness be more than we can manage? We already have rising obesity, which means the rising extent of diabetes, and as a consequence, many expensive conditions, including coronary heart disease. Then there's the issue of the management and sustainability of entitlement, Social Security and Medicare, and finally, the common and unfortunate practice of ageism. And I had mentioned a few minutes ago, that means that many older people today who can't afford to retire, or have retired or would like to go back to work, are facing prejudice greater than younger people are facing. But they don't have as much time to recoup their financial situation as the younger person would. And there's much denial. I think if you move in front, I think you should have that sorry. There's much denial. We don't all want to be thinking about old age all the time. And, and we shouldn't be thinking about old age all the time. We have to think about it enough to properly prepare ourselves and to do as so as a society. So we have to get the attention of the policymakers, and that's not easy, because I mentioned one of the great figures in political life in the 1960s, 70s, 80s was Claude Pepper. We don't have any Claude Peppers in our Congress, unfortunately, anymore. And this issue of aging, despite the dramatic increase and the profound consequences which I mentioned, has not reached the tipping point. It's another inconvenient truth. We haven't really dealt with the reality of a society that's growing older. And that's true throughout the world, with the possible exception of Japan. So these concerns, we've already mentioned, go on. So I want to point out on the question, can we afford older people, in some very interesting new work of very diverse schools of economic thought the Conservative University of Chicago, the Rand Corporation, Harvard, Yale, Belfast, and our own center that shows the surprising fact that with the rise of longevity and health, more wealth is created by society. That's a new idea. Now the reverse, that as societies get richer, they're more apt to be benevolent if they have a good government and provide more benefits for their people. But that the reverse would be true, that as societies live longer and more healthily, that this would result in greater wealth, as I repeat, is the new idea. There are studies, for example, that show that nations that have a five-year advantage in life expectancy have a more rapid and larger gross domestic product. Now, how would this be the case? Well, James Smith, an economist at the Rand Corporation, follows a cohort that is a broad group of young people throughout their lives. He does this through historical analysis. If you have, but to put it down to a single individual, if you have a healthy childhood, in general, you're more apt to have a healthy adulthood. If you have a healthy adulthood, you've been more apt to have had a better education. Had a better education, more apt to have had a better job, more apt to have saved more and invested more, and more apt to have a productive old age. So additively, if you have more and more individuals that have this kind of life, you can see where health relates to wealth. The second is what we call the silver industries. Most of these industries very much relate to age. The reason you save money is you want to get your first home, you want to get married, you want to see your kids through college. You also want to protect yourself through retirement, through pension systems. So financial services are very much always pointed to the future, and that relates to the reality 
of a society growing more logical and older. Legal services, healthcare services, housing and living arrangements, travel and hospitality, all bear upon the idea that the Japanese call silver industries, we call the mature market. Now the old issue keeps coming up with intergenerational conflicts. There are no studies in the United States that show this at all. Young people are not negative toward old people in that sense. Young people may fear that they themselves will get their social security, but all the voting shows, all the polls show, they don't want to take away social security from older people. So at least so far in this country, we haven't gotten intergenerational conflicts. I suppose it could happen if the media keep hyping it and the people keep talking about it. Next slide. Change of topic. I said this is a diverse audience, so I want to be receptive to all of you older people, service providers, etc. So I'm going to say a little bit about the standard things we need to take good care of ourselves. They're, we all know what they are, so it's hard to do them. <laughs> Exercise, including the speed with which you move from the dinner table. <laughs> Diet, which should be low calorie. No tobacco and really moderate alcohol. But alcohol is a topic that does not get fully addressed in this country. One out of every four American families are adversely affected by alcohol. So many of the highway fatalities are related to alcohol. Abuse of older people, children, and spouses, very much related to alcohol. But yet we are not adequately addressing the issue of alcohol and alcoholism in the United States. Next. So what kind of exercise? Well, it's not just aerobic, although I certainly counsel. I would love to see everybody walk together. And it's just a wonderful opportunity to have a friend to walk together. You don't have to join an expensive health club. Just walk makes some more of a difference. But we don't only want to be thinking about aerobic exercise. That is walking, which helps build the stamina and the heart. We also need to be thinking about our muscles. Very important, especially our thigh muscles called the quadriceps, because we don't want to fall, and I'll get to that in a second. And you also need to be thinking of balance, flexibility, and posture. Next. So I've been forever, not successfully, but forever trying to get people to move. And I would love to see a national walking movement. It would be totally inexpensive. We can get the President's Council of Physical Fitness and Sports. We get the National Preventive Task Force, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, various nonprofit, non governmental organizations such as this great area here in Warren County. You just walk with a friend, walk with a neighborhood, walk with a child. It just would make such a difference. Next. Falls are the number 12 cause of death of people over 65. And once you fall, you tend to be very leery about yourself because it's dramatic and it's frightening and it's disturbing. No one wants to get a broken hip. So I really do want to emphasize strength and balance. Next. Quadriceps, even your squats. That means you get your back up against the wall. You've got some weights in your hand, maybe even a pound of sugar. And just go down to a sitting position. Or sit in a chair. Don't use the arms of the chair. Put your arms folded in front of you and go up and down 15 times. Do it twice. Do it every other day or even every day. It will have an enormous effect upon the likelihood of your not having a broken hip. Thanks. Fruits and vegetables, seven and nine a day, great. Fish, multivitamins, sometimes an expensive form of urine. You probably, if you had your fruits and vegetables, if you had your fruits and vegetables, you probably would need anything except the cheapest, least expensive multivitamin if you think you're not eating an adequate amount of fruits and vegetables. But vitamin D is special, it does seem so. Our bodies in America have not had an adequate supply. So you probably should take a thousand or more capsules of vitamin D every day. Thanks.